Wow, God is good all the time. God is good. Somebody say Jesus. 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 There is no other name, not above the earth or in the earth or below the earth. There is no other name above the name of Jesus. Man, how am I supposed to go after that? (laughs) Thanks, babe. I feel good now. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter 15. We continue in our series talking about winning relationships, healthy relationships. Not a bad little turnout this morning between the time change and the weather and the roundup and all the, the stuff that tries to make everybody stay home. Luke chapter 15, going to begin reading in verse 11, a f- familiar passage that most everybody will be familiar with. It says this, And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, and he went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything... A severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished or in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men... Have more than enough bread, and I am here dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up, and he came to the father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf. Kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they begin to celebrate. Pray with me, Father, we love you, Father. We thank you that that you come after us, Lord. We thank you that you're patient with us. We thank you, God, that you don't give up on us, Lord. I just pray, Father, that in the spirit of freedom, that we wouldn't feel pressure today, God. But we give you permission to speak in this place today, Father. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all figured out. That's why we're here, because we need you, the one who is perfect. Have your way in this service. Touch and change lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So if you haven't been with us or you have been with us, we've been talking about relationships, winning healthy relationships, talking about things that habits that will help our relationships, that will enhance them. And we begin to understand that just above everything, that, that even though some of us fight it, some of us try to hide from it, some of us deny it, but the reality is this. We are created for relationships. We're created for connection with God, and we're created for connection with people. When we're joined with people, when we're going the same way with people, it helps us do things that we could never do on our own. It helps us to fulfill our lives. It helps us to do more than we ever thought we could. It helps us to become all that we can be. It helps aid us when we're struggling. And you know what? It helps humble us sometimes when we feel like we got it all going on and we get a little bit proud. It empowers us ultimately to establish the kingdom of God wherever we are, to share Him with the world that we live in. Now, we've discussed some of these habits that can help our relationship. We talked about first about loving ourselves, about understanding that God loves us, and so we have value that we're not nothing because we've been damaged or we've messed up or whatever the case may be. We talked about the importance of in, investing in, our, in people 
depositing into relationships so that we can build up accounts that we can both draw from. Because if we don't, we get bankrupt, then that's when it gets very difficult. We talked about being real. The, the, the fact that so many people in life, we wear masks. We put on a show and, and, and we play pretend, but when we get to the core and we start building these relationships on false pretenses, it gets very frustrating and it gets very hard because at the end of the day, it's like we really don't know this, pe- this, this person that I'm in this relationship with. And last week, we talked about the power of commitment. When we're committed to by someone, it brings security. When we understand how committed God to, is to us, it brings security in our lives. We all need to have a little bit of security, amen, to know that somebody will commit to me and somebody needs to know that, that I'm committed to them. They're all important parts, and you know what? Well, some of us may do really good in some of these areas, but then there may be some other areas that we struggle with or we need to work on. And honestly, not to be negative, but, but we need to understand this, that, that some d- relationships are difficult. And in some relationships, sometimes they don't work. You know what? I've, I've dealt with people, and I've dealt with couples, and I've prayed with them, and we've talked, and we've been open, and, and, and we both they want to make it work, and they're willing, but yet we see one relationship that goes and it flourishes, and, and another relationship that struggles and just continues to, to splinter along the way. And, and, you know, we've all been hurt. We've all failed at relationships. We have. We've all done it. We've all been on, on one part of these things. It's, it, it's, it's affected us, but the reality is this. We have a choice to make. We can say, well, we, we can look at it and say, well, this is my fault and I'm no good, and so I'm not worthy to be in a relationship. Or we can look at somebody else and say, well, it was their fault, and so I never let them go, and I hold that against and so people are all going to treat me that way, and I'm not going to enter into And things happen in life. There's difficulties in life. Sometimes circumstances come in a relationship and it's hard to overcome and we face things. And sometimes we deal with death and we lose people and we get mad. And we feel like even God is against us because things don't work out. But here's the question that we have to ask. When these failures happen in relationships and it begins to shackle us, will will we let it shackle us and keep us from entering into other relationships? Or will we get let go? Will we move forward freely, trusting, willing to enter into relationships? So the passage that we look at today in Luke 15, the prodigal son. And there's so much in this passage. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at it a little different than probably I've ever done it before. But in this passage, we understand that the, the, the dad represents God. And it says in verse 11, it says that this man had two sons. And that just makes me think about, you know what, we're all different. We're all going to respond differently to relationships. We're all going to respond differently to God. And we have to, at some point, we have to be okay with that. Or we're going to be very frustrated with everybody that doesn't do things and get things the same way I do. He had two sons. And you know what, this man, if we, if we step back and look at it, we can, we, can, we can portray that this man loved his kids. He lived for his kids. He built this inheritance for his kids. He wanted them to take over his business, to take over what he was doing. He ultimately had given his life for them. It's not doing this about me, but this is about my kids. But you know what? Here's the interesting. We can see this, that home wasn't perfect. See, this is real because none of our homes are perfect. You know what, if you're sitting here today or you're listening, say, well, you pastor a church, so you know what, Carter, your, your home must be perfect. Your family must be perfect. Your life must be perfect. Can I let you in on a little secret? I'm not perfect. My family's not perfect. We have struggles. We deal with things. It's not easy. This family had struggles. Look, the youngest son has a little bit of an attitude. Any of your kids have attitude? Did you have an attitude? We see this son that had an attitude in verse 12. He says this. He says, I want what's mine. He said, I want my share of the inheritance. I don't care about you, Dad. I don't care about this life. I don't care about what we have right now. I want what I want now. You're dying too slow. I can't wait until you're dead to receive my inheritance. I want it now. What he was saying was, you're dead to me already. 
Can I just say this to young people? When you disrespect your mom and dad and we, you don't do what they ask and you blow up, you know what you're doing? You're saying to your mom and dad, in effect, I don't care about you and really right now you're dead to me because I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to have any of that. This is what the son said. So we all know if we take, think about this story or we're watching a movie or somebody reads this story, we, we know what we're thinking. We know what's going to happen, right? It's like, come on, Dad, don't do it, man. Don't give him the stuff because he's going to blow it. He's going to run off over there to the, to, the, to the dance last night. He's going to blow it all, man. Don't do it. Don't let him go. But amazingly, what's the dad do? He releases him. He lets him go. In verse 12, it says he divided up all of his wealth between his son. And he said, here it is, son. If this is what you want to do, go get it. Spread your wings and fly, buddy. Take off. Do you remember when you left home? What did that look like? I know I I remember when I left home in my own self. I thought, man, I got this deal. You just stand back and watch me go, Jack. I'm fixing to conquer the world, man. I don't, I'm free now. I don't need the rules. I don't need nobody telling me nothing. I don't need nobody questioning me what time I'm coming home, where I've been, why there's mud on my mirrors. I don't need any of that stuff. I'm going to do this thing, man. I got it. I can relate to the prodigal son. I think many of us can. So I want to talk to you for a little bit today about this habit, the power of release. How good are we at releasing things you see this father consider we just consider that this father had done all that he could do he had raised his son now listen to me i'm not talking about children that are living in her house and just say hey do whatever you want to do i don't care i'm not saying that but i'm talking about this man had become of age and he was now at a point where he was legally and able to make his own decisions And so this father had done all that he could do. He had showed him. He had taught him. He had influenced him. He had tried to guide him. But he knew this. And this is true for every one of us. He knew, the dad did, that ultimately, no matter what I want, no matter how hard I'm going to try, ultimately, it's the son's choice. In life, it's ultimately our choice. What do we do? Where are we going to go? Which direction are we going to think? What, what decision are we going to make? You know what? This is so hard to comprehend, even for me, but the dad let the son go. Many times in life, we try to hang on, man. We try to provide. We try to bail him out. We try to do all this stuff. The, the, the dad didn't do any of that. He didn't badger him. He didn't lecture him. He just said, if that's what you're going to do, son, then there it is. Go get it. You know what the father was doing? The father wasn't giving up. The father was saying this to the son. I love you enough to let you go. I love you enough to release you. If this is not what you're feeling right now, if this is not your choice, then I'm going to let you know. Many of you know parents with grown kids. You understand how difficult it is to let your kids go. I, we're just beginning with it. I don't look forward to it. And we're already beginning with Neely going off to college and things change. It's, it's, it's difficult. But here's the thing. Some ask this question. Maybe you've done it. Some ask this question. I've been asked recently. If God is so good, why is there disease in the world? If God is so good, why is there starvation? Why are there fires that are burning up, that are destroying everybody? Why is there devastation? If God is so good, why are so many people hurting? Why is the world such a mess if God is so good? You know what? If that's people's mindset, I can't make all of that okay. Because everything that we can say, everything that I can come with, there's always another question. But I will say this, one reason is this, because God has given us a very awesome gift, and that is the gift of choice. He gives us free will. He doesn't want slaves. He's not going to march, line us all up, and we all march the same way, and we all talk the same way, and we all pray the same way, and we all do everything the same way. He's not looking for robots, but what he's looking for is people to have the choice to choose 
whether I'm going to come to church, to choose whether I'm going to serve God, to choose whether I'm going to love Him, to choose whether I trust Him because there's no love and there's no real relationship if you're making someone do it, if you make your spouse do everything, if you make your children do everything, if you make everybody do everything, you're a boss and you're working over that night shift and you're making them and you're making them and you're making them. Yeah, you direct them, you let them know what's expected, but if we continue to make, to make, to make, They're going to blow up. Are y'all okay this morning? Because y'all are really somber. The weather's got you. God wants us to choose him. We have a choice. What will we cheat? Will we we receive the Father's inheritance? What he's doing? Will we trust him and wait on those things for what he wants us to have? Or will we step over here and say, forget it, man. I'm going my own way. I'm doing my own thing. I'm going where I want to go. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show y'all. I'm doing it my way. There was a song about that, I think. Choice from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve. He says, I love you, man. I give you everything. But this one thing. I'm really recommending you leave this alone. But at the end of the day, I'm giving you the choice. I'm giving you the choice. When Abraham was called out in Genesis chapter 12, and God called Abraham, and he says, hey, man, I'm bringing you out of this stuff. I want to set you free. I want to do a new thing. I'm going to break generational curses, but you're going to have to choose to come with me. You're going to have to step out of that place. And Abraham went, and later in Genesis 22, Abraham had waited 100 years, and he finally got a son, Isaac. And then about 12 years later, God says, now bring Isaac to me. Bring him and sacrifice him to me. And you know what? Abraham didn't have to do it, but God was testing him to see if he was really committed to God or he had all of a sudden become committed to something else. Sometimes we begin to commit more to people and put them in the center instead of putting God in the center. He said, it's your choice, Abraham. Do you want the best that I have for you? Do you want to walk in the promises? Or are you just going to hang on to what you have? Or are you just going to try to make your own little thing work? What about when God had delivered the people through Moses out of Egypt and they came into the promised land and Joshua was leading them and everything was blessed and they were possessing the land and it was being bountiful to them and they had a great harvest and everything was great, man. But they began to deter a little bit and they began to get their focus off of God. And what did Joshua say in Joshua 24? 15 he says choose now for this day whom you will serve either the forefathers and the stuff in this land or choose God but for, as for me and mine we're choosing God the reality is this we have to make a choice Deuteronomy eleven twenty six, the Lord says I'm setting before you today blessings and a curse if you choose me you can have blessings but if you choose yourself you're going to find curse what do you want I'm laying it there this is the way it is It's your choice. What are you going to do? We all know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What's it say? Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. We all know the Scripture. We've quoted it. But when it gets down to the nitty-gritty, when it gets down to the cutting, we have to make the choice. Do I believe in the Scripture? Will I trust in this? Man, this is just, I shouldn't, I don't really have time to go there. But Jack and Linda Guerin, this this, this week's been unbelievable, man. And they're trusting in the Lord. They don't have to. They could be freaked out. They could be, let me just give you a little insight on the other day, what went on. We get phone calls. You got to come now. It's bad. We get get there. They've got the ventilator. He's on the ventilator. And and they tell him, man. He he says, I don't want to live like this. They had had to get him back, back woken up, get his heart going again. They said, your kidneys are failing. Your lungs are weak. It don't look good. You're going to have to be on the ventilator. Jack says, I don't want to be on the ventilator. I don't want to live my life like this, man. And so, you know what? They said, well, if you take it out. So he waits for all the kids. As soon as all the kids, the grandkids who can't get here, we're taking it out. This is it. They're writing letters, man. He's writing notes to all of his family. He's writing notes. He's got a trach in. He's breathing. And he's writing notes to his kids and his grandkids. Well, this is what I expect. And they tell him this could be slow. It could be immediate. But this is what's going to happen. And you know what they're, they're saying right there? Linda, is, she don't want to let him go. But Jack's saying this. I'm ready. 
This is not what God's called me to do. I'm ready to go. And you know what Linda had to do? She had to choose. And you know what they chose? We trust God. Not our will be done, but God's will be done. We're trusting you, God. We're giving you our life, your breath and our lungs. We pour out our praise. We're going to give it to you. We trust you. They pull the trach out. He begins charging his children, charging his grandkids. This is what I'm, you know, he's just bland. It's I just can't even do it justice. Fifteen minutes later, he's getting stronger. He's gaining strength. Thirty minutes later, an hour later, the doctor's hair's blowed off. I don't know what's going on. We're expecting slow death and decline. He's increasing. Could it be because they released and said our choice is to serve God. Our choice is to, is to glorify him in life and also glorify him in death. The peace of God which passes all understanding came in that place, man. I've never seen anything like it. In a, in a moment of life and death, they chose to trust God. Where am I at? Here's the thing with us. We can't make anyone get right. We can't make anyone get saved. We can't make anyone do what I want them to do. Not forever anyway. Freedom can change a mind. See, the miracle in this scripture that Jesus is teaching us is the dad let him go. The dad released him. It says in verses 13 through 16 of Luke 15, it says the son wasted everything. Anybody wasted everything? He went off doing his living, drinking, partying, chasing wild women, doing all the stuff. Whatever was offered, he did it. And give every, he lost everything he had. There was a famine. He became hungry. He hired himself out. He don't have nothing. He's feeding the hogs, which for a Jewish boy, that's a whole nother message. But he's down in the slop feeding pigs. And he begins to say, man, I'm going to eat some of this crinkled corn. I'm going to eat some of this regurgitated stuff, the fat and what's left over. I'm going to eat some of this, man, because I don't have anything. But in verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses, this is key for every one of us, man. At some point, we got to come to our senses. We got to quit being a little boy and a little girl and playing these little pity pat games and being jealous and thinking somebody's against me and they're not doing it the way I want. We got to come to our senses. It says when he came to his senses, and it's like he said, wait a minute, man. I have a choice here. I realize where I'm at. And in humility, he says, I'm going to swallow my pride. And I'm going to quit acting like a moron. And I'm going to go back to my dad. I don't have to be here. He says even my father's hired hands have more than enough and extra to spare. And in verse 18, he says, I know what I'll do. He says, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go home. And he's going to say, Dad, I failed. Dad, I messed it up. Dad, I screwed up your name. Dad, just let me come home. Just make me one of your hired hands. I'm not worthy for anything. And you know the story. He goes and before he even gets there, it says the father sees him afar off. And he runs to meet him. And he grabs him up in his arm. And he gathers him up. And the son begins to say, Dad, I'm a failure, man. I'm a loser. I screwed it up. I missed the shot. I made a mockery out of you. I did everything wrong. I have nothing left. I'm not worthy to be your son. And the dad said, forget it, man. I'm taking you in. He said, get a ring. Get a robe. Kill the fat. Added calf, put some shoes on his feet because we're going to celebrate. I released him when I let him go, but now this, I'm releasing all of his failures, man. I'm taking him back. You are part of the family. You are reinstated. The power of release and repentance is tough. Repentance can be hard to say, I messed up. I bet you there's some of us that if we ask somebody else, they would say, I've never heard them say, I'm sorry. I've never heard them admit that they messed up. They know it. Repentance can be hard. Relationships can be hard. Amen? Marriages are difficult. Parenting is difficult. Friendships become estranged. Church family, oh my gosh. There's givers, there's takers. People have different motives. We have different perspectives. We have different desires. We have different backgrounds. We're in different seasons in life. And then not only that, but there's this dude called Satan that absolutely hates you. 
John 10, 10, he comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And the main thing he wants to destroy is relationships, families, friendships that are healthy. He wants to beat you down, and he wants us to settle for these relationships that are unhealthy, these relationships that bring us down instead of lift us up. Because he knows that when God's people get connected and our relationship get healthy and we get Christ in the center and the Holy Spirit begins to move in our lives, that the enemy can't stop us and the gates of hell can't overcome us and the light that was in us will drive out the darkness of all lands. And so the enemy is coming against us. But the reality is this, we can't force a relationship. Have you ever tried to force one? You really wanted this relationship. You wanted it to work. And man, you were going and you were doing and you were just smothering and you are forcing you see god doesn't force anything he is a gentleman and you know what even him he doesn't have all great relationships he offers it he desires it but he doesn't make it we talked about last week in mark chapter 10 the rich young ruler and he comes to jesus like what do i need to do i know there's something more and jesus tells him This is what you need to do. And in verse 21 of Mark 10, it says that Jesus looked on him with compassion and he loved him. And he said, man, this is what you got to do. Get rid of it, man, and come and follow me. He looked at him with sadness because he loved him because he came in to die for him. But at the end of the day, he said, I can't make you. I can't force you to do this. I'm going to offer it and I'm going to keep going. Winning relationships are not one-sided. We're going to have healthy relationships. It don't work with just one. It takes how many to tango? How many? It takes two to tango. And if we're going to line dance, we've got to have a whole bunch. <laughs> we can't make people like us. We can't make people love us. We can't make people respect us, stay married to us, keep playing golf with us, keep working with us, worship with us. Man, I think I want everyone I know to come and worship with us. I want everyone I know to be here, but I can't make them. We can't make them. It's by choice. Whether they come, whether they serve, whether they enter into relationship. Have you ever seen a kid with an animal? Have you ever seen a young child grab a dog or a cat? They just love them, man. They just, ah. And they get a hold of them, man, they squeeze the life out of them. And most normal ones, what happened? A cat, Row! and they're scratching and clawing, man. They're headed to the Christmas tree, the attic somewhere. They're out of there, man. And they may be around. They see that kid, go, and they're gone again. And you're like, baby, be easy, man. Be easy. But the child wants it so bad, wants to hold it, wants to touch it, wants to squeeze it. He wants it so bad, but it it runs the the animal off. Do you remember that maybe it was a great aunt you had, and you didn't see her all that often? Maybe every once in a while at a reunion, and every time she'd see you, and she'd come at you, man. She's trying to get her hands on you. You Oh, I just love you so much. Come here, give me some sugar. You're like, whoa, man. Let's go outside. Let's play tag. It's the same with relationships. We have to give people some sense of freedom. I think about I'm fixing to go in a couple weeks to Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, for a deal I've done for nine years or so now. For, for go there and work this this cult starting event and the church service that's, that's grown over there on Sunday. But I think about this cult starting and what it is. They got horses, Bronx from the two year olds from the from the four sixes, and they take them up there and they have these competitors and they 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 all take them and they judge and how far they can do and all the stuff they can do. And you know what they're doing? They're trying to build relationships. They get in the round pen and these horses don't want any part of them and they make them move this way and they make them move that way and they go at them a little bit and they invest a little bit. And then they step back and then they deposit a little bit and they get, let, say, let them know I'm staying in here with you. I'm committed to you. And all they're trying to do initially is just get them to turn their head and look at them. All they're trying to do is just get them to watch them. And then eventually they'll get them to take one step towards them. 
And this is like this relationship that they're creating this safe place and they're committing to them and they're investing into them and they're letting them know that we can do better things together than we can separated fighting each other. But it's a give and take relationship. They push in and then they give them a release. They give them some freedom. They let them take a breath. We can't neglect the choice and freedom in our relationships. Sometimes in love, we love somebody. And you know what we do? We dominate them. We bull rush them. I'm the leader by God. This is what you're going to do, woman. Or the woman. I'm doing this. I don't care what you want, baby. I'm out of here. I'm going to go shop. And I'm going to go do this. And I'm going to go do that. And maybe I'll see you later. And we dominate the other we become too controlling. Maybe some of you have seen somebody like this, but we're in a relationship, and all of a sudden we, we start getting a little closer, but instead of being secure about it, it's like we get insecure. I want to know what you're doing every minute of the day. I want to know every phone call you made. I want to know where every dollar you spent is going. I want to know what text messages you're sending. I want to know who you're hanging out with besides me. We begin clamping in. We begin smothering. I see this with young people. Well, I can't do anything. They got to see all my text messages. They got to know everything I'm doing. They got to know everything I'm talking to. I'm thinking right then, man, this is going down fast. Because we start smothering. We don't trust. We're doing it because we're loved. We're doing it because we're insecure. But what we're doing is pushing them away. We're mashing them. We all need a little bit of space. Somebody say space. You know what I would love for my wife, Tessa? To stay home all the time, to be at my beckoning call, to have that meal ready, to be dressed in them nice pajamas. Woo! <laughs> but you know what? That would be a disaster. <laughs> because she's not wired that way. It could be the flip. For other relationships, but she's not wired that way. I wish my I wish my girls would never have to go off into the world, especially boys. As good as they are, they're still boys. I wish they didn't have to be exposed to the things of the world. But if I don't let them go, they'll never become all that they could become. I wish Mighty Man didn't want to carry a knife all the time. At this point, for sure. I wish he wouldn't get up on the bar and jump across to the couch. There's some stuff that I wish he wouldn't do, but I know this. If he doesn't do some of this stuff, he'll never become the mighty man of God that he's called to become. One that conquers. One that is a hunter. He would never become a lion chaser. You see, I could control them and I could try to make them. But at the end of the day, they would resent me if they didn't completely rebel. And that's what this father shows us. That's what the Lord shows us. He says, I love you enough to let you go. You have to give freedom to people. Just the same way I give you freedom. Releasing. 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 I already said it, but he released him to go. But this is important. When he came home and he repented, he also released him from the guilt. He let it go. So many times we, we'll bring one back and we hold it over their head. Our spouse messes up and we hold it over their head. We keep bringing it up for years. We'll get together and something will happen. Well, yeah, I remember that time. And we bring it all back. We have to release. God releases our sins. He forgives us. He lets us choose. Do what you want to do. I want you to come meet. I died for you. I'll give you the best. I'll provide for you. I'll be there. I'll help you. I'll comfort you. I'll encourage you. But you're going to have to choose it. And he lets us choose to go our own way and go chase snakes, so to speak, and go do our own kind of dancing and do our own kind of thing. But then the moment we come back, you know what he does? He accepts us. He meets us right where we are. He doesn't wait on us to come to the church. He don't wait on us to get everything right. He just says, come back now. I'm going to accept you. I'm going to put a ring on you. I'm going to put shoes on your feet, a robe on you. We're going to party because everything is good. I forgive you. I've covered you, man. I want you back. The power of release. Somebody say, release. I'm out of time. Quit. I don't have time, evidently, but we're going to do it anyway because it's just us. Very quickly, just a few habits, things that we can do to give people a little bit of freedom. Number one is this. Don't be so possessive. 
in your relationships. Don't be so possessive. We own things. We don't own people. Number two is this. Give people some privacy. We have to give each other a little space, man. We have to trust. We have to let, let us have our own little window of time sometimes. I know housewives, man, you're, sometimes you're in it all day and you're with the kids and you're doing this. You're trying to do the best you can. And we come home as men and we're like, da, da, da. Why ain't this? Why ain't this? We need to go. Sometimes we have to give each other a little window. Let our woman step outside and us step in. That's just an example. Number three is this. Other relationships are okay. Sometimes it's like we have a relationship like, you can't talk to nobody else. Well, why are you talking to them, Kirk? Well, what are you doing about this, Landon? What are you doing? No, we have to let it be okay for other relationships. Can I tell you this? Women need other women. Men need other men. Women need things that men can't do, okay? They need other relationships. Number four is this. Honor the choices that others make. Somebody makes a choice that maybe you wouldn't have chose. We have to honor that when they're of age. You know, we have to honor that choice. And then if it works out, let's rejoice in it with them. And if it don't work out, ride them like a Shetland pony. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. Let them go and walk through it with them. Keep loving them. (laughs) Release people. You know what? Sometimes people clash. Our attitudes, our mindsets, our personalities are difficult. Sometimes in in relationships, we have to give each other a way out. It's like sometimes we get trapped and we can't get out. We have to be honest and mature enough to sometimes allow people a little space and allow people a little freedom. And you know what? Things may be better after we take a deep breath. We inhale and we exhale a couple times. That reminds me of back when I was rodeoing. And you'd have a rodeo partner and you you might go off for six weeks in the spring to California. Or you'd load up in the first of June and you'd take off up north and to the west. And you wouldn't come home till August or September. And you were committed to this thing, man. I'm talking about about it's deeper than a marriage and you get off in the middle of it and like this dude is driving me nuts his habits he, his smells the way he organizes the way he, all this it's just driving me nuts and so you make it through that season and then you you separate and you may go another way and then you come back and you may find out that this turns into one of your best friends because there's space and there's a way out and then we can reconnect have some freedom Remember, the last one is this. Keep Christ in the middle of your life. Music team, you can come. We have to keep Christ in the middle of our life. I I mentioned this earlier, but sometimes as people, this is what we do. We'll put a man or we'll put a woman in the center of our life and say, they're the ones. They're going to complete me. i got to have them. They're going to provide everything for me. Can I tell you? That's too much pressure because there is no man that's going to live up to that. It's not fair to man. It's not fair to us. They can't live up to it. we got to have Christ Jesus that we sang about earlier. It's all Jesus. So I close with this, just a few questions. Are you holding on too tightly in a relationship with someone? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's even a kid. And we're just, we love them so much. And we're just, we're so scared. That something might go wrong and we're trying to make it all perfect. And we need to give a little room. Number two is this. Would you be willing to release past failures? Maybe for yourself. Maybe you're here and you, you've been blaming yourself for this relationship. And you, you messed up and you did wrong. Would you be willing to release yourself? God's already released you. He's just waiting on you. Come on. Or maybe it's somebody else that did us wrong. Maybe it was a relationship, a marriage. Maybe it was a parent. We've been, we've just, all our lives, we've had this like little thing in us. And we just, we won't let it go. And maybe it's time to just let it go. Because it's the enemy trying to keep me from healthy relationships. Keep me from being real. Would we be willing to give a little bit of freedom? To those in our life to make their own choices and still support them even if they don't do it exactly the way I want them to maybe you're here today and you need to forgive somebody that you fear failed you that you feel failed you maybe there's somebody and you know exactly 
You're thinking, I wish you wouldn't ask that. But maybe there's somebody in your life that you, you feel like they failed you. And maybe you just need to release them. To show them Christ by releasing them. Maybe even allowing them back into your life. Isn't that what the Lord did for us? We failed him. We did everything wrong. He released us and he accepted us. Healthy relationships. Freedom is crucial. What's the Lord saying to you as we close in worship? Pray with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for loving us, God. Lord, first I just speak peace in this place, God. That your breath would come in this place and it would take away all false pretense and all anything that the enemy would try to tell us that would keep us from hearing what you're saying to us. Lord, I pray that no one in this place would be shackled today from a past failure. And for those of us who feel squeezed, I speak release. That we would breathe, God. For those of us who, who, who say, you know what, I'm, I'm holding too tightly. I haven't given freedom. I've been too controlling. Lord, I just pray that you would help us, like the young man, come to our senses, God. And we would come back and say, this is not the way I want to be. I'm doing this because I really do love them. And I really do want relationship. God, help me release and back off a little. So I just encourage you today, as the Lord speaks to you to respond, the altars are open. If you need prayer, if you're struggling in a relationship, if you feel smothered, I just encourage you to come. Let us pray with you, for you. Come with somebody. Bring somebody with you and say, this is how I feel. Help me. Maybe your marriage, you say, what, this is something we need to work on. Maybe a man and woman would come together. Father, I just pray that you move in this place. We close in worship. We love you. We thank you, Father, for giving us the freedom.